better never ends. In health, in performance, no matter your starting point, you can always strive for better. My name is Charlie Goodchild, I'm your host, and this is the Better Never Ends podcast. We've made it our mission to share with you the expertise and wisdom of role models and leading experts in their field, teaching us about how we can be better, telling stories about their journey to better, and inspiring you to discover yours. So today's podcast with psychologist Martin Turner was putting the very title of this podcast on trial, Better Never Ends. Does it hold up to scrutiny by, from the scientific and psychology literature? And also, so Martin has, has worked in a number of different uh, paradigms. He's worked in um, sport, he's worked in academia, he's worked in the corporate environment. So he's worked with people in lots of different spaces and, and he challenges our beliefs on goal setting and is, is that really what we're trying to do or are we looking at something broader, something more holistic? It really challenged my own uh, perception of what what I'm doing, what I'm doing as a professional as well, and, and this this aligns with some of the thoughts I've been having around this concept of better never ends, and that this nuance about is better never ends a, a holistic uh, virtue, or is better never ends something that we are targeting for a very specific task, and if it is just something very specific, is that doomed for disappointment in the future? There's a lot of philosophy within this, so we do go deep. This is something that I thought might be coming because whenever me and Martin talk, we go deep on conversation. So I hope you'll come with me on this journey. It really, really got got my interest and really challenged my own belief. So I hope that it does the same for you. And if you're someone who's wondering about how you go about being better, this is a really good place to start because it's, it's it, it really begins you. Um, it really takes you to the, to the very beginning of what we're doing here of better never ends. But you've got to understand why first and, and who you are who you are as a person, as a character to, to, to really get you started. And if you get that right, then your possibilities are endless. So yeah, listen up. So today we have Martin Turner in the studio. Uh, Martin is a, a friend of mine first and psychology second, I would say in that order. But today he's going to talk to us about the psychology of better never ends. So I wanted to raise the idea of Better never ends, not necessarily always being about the positive and, and where the negatives of better never ends might come in. And also hopefully off the back of that, we can then discuss the application of it into the everyday person. How does the everyday person apply this concept? So Martin is a psychologist by trade and works out of Manchester University and has also spent uh, pretty much all of your career, I believe, working in sport as well. You like working with both athletes and and working in academia, I know you've re- um, released a lot of papers and a lot of books. Can you give us a bit more of a background, Martin, about your um, what you've done along along your career? Yeah, well, do firstly, uh, thank you for inviting me. Hello to the audience. Um, it's great to be here with Charlie. Um, yeah, talking about everything psychology, hopefully, and this concept of better never ends, which absolutely keen to get into more deeply. I've been really looking at probably since probably for about 10, just over 10 years, this this sort of idea that you can shape the way that you think and feel and behave um, through taking control of the things that you can control, usually your beliefs about the world, your thoughts about situations and the world. And that's been the thing that kind of unites the different bits and pieces of work that I've done um, in research, you know, um, collecting data and writing papers and things and books but also as a, as a consultant, as a practitioner, it seems to be unified by that kind of core idea of, of, of try to take control of the things that you can control, which are usually the things, you know, between your ears. And then, you know, if we can figure out how to do that first, then we can figure out how to make things better. I think that's a, a big thing, isn't it? To firstly establish if the thing you are worrying about or struggling with is something that you can be in control of. And, and that, that element of control or not is not always obvious to, to people, is it? I think people have more control than they probably think they do. Mm-hmm. You know, um, initially when you start working with people, there is that sense that sometimes things are spiraling and, 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 and sometimes their life could be, you know, a performer, could be in their home life, could be in relationships, that things are spiraling uh, out of control. Mm-hmm. And that part of the job of, of a psychologist like me, who has that philosophy, I suppose, is to help them to see the things that they can control within that sometimes chaos and sometimes mess and to, to get your hooks into those bits and pieces 
And you, you mentioned about um, the type of psychology that you do being quite different perhaps to others. So, so what is it about your style of psychology or the, the, the um, branch psychology you work within that, that makes it different? Well, I think, you know, psychology is complicated because, you know, every year the discipline grows, you know, and you could see this from just look on the shelves of uh, W.H. Smith's or, or whatever it is, looking at the different pop psychology books you can buy and, and self-help trends, mm. you know. Quite often those trends are based on scientific principles. Um, sometimes they're not. Um, and quite often the scientific principle they're based upon is something that we would call a cognitive behavioral therapy or or a cognitive behavioral approach to psychology, which, you know, has been around since the 50s, but really was sort of happened upon by the ancient Stoics, you know, 2000 years ago. So it's been around for a while. It's a very scientific approach to helping people to, to deal with life's challenges and changes and, and all sorts of, you know, vicissitudes. Um, principles, ideas, programs that are based upon that scientific, you know, scientific idea um, seem to be well grounded. And when we deviate from that, we do move into spaces that are less, I mean, less evidence based, not to say they're less valuable, but they're just less evidence based. So the way that I approach things is through that cognitive behavioral lens, because it gives me confidence that there's an evidence base there. Mm -hmm. And when I start to, even in my own mind, in my own practice, start to deviate from that, then I have to pull myself back and be strict with myself in some ways to, to not venture into areas that I don't feel there's uh, much evidence for. So I guess what, what I'm trying to gauge now is, is there a, an evidence base and a, a, and a safe uh, grounding to essentially confidently promote this concept of better mm. never ends? And I yeah. guess it might be a bit late for that now, given that I've got an entire podcast that and business that, that's running on it. But yeah. um, th this was a term that, uh, as, as some of the listeners will already know, that I took from both of our friends and, and the ex-England head coach, head, head futsal coach, Michael Scubala, which was better never ends. It was a term he used to use to the players, promoting them to essentially just trying to drive them forward. And, and I, it just always stuck with me and, and landed as a, a term that made sense in my head and helped me understand my own value system and my own mm. why. But now I'm getting a bit further down the thought process with that, perhaps it's maturing in my own head. I get to the point where I think maybe sometimes better does end and perhaps this terminology of better never ends can be unhelpful if, if applied in the wrong way. Mm. So then I, I think, well, to me, better never ends is about the, the particular task I'm currently working on. I can, uh, is it finite? And, and probably not. It, it probably gets to a point and in some, like my rugby career is a good example. At that point, there was a point where better did end in my own perception of rugby for me. Mm. I got to the point where physically I probably wasn't going to get any better. I then didn't have the time to commit to bettering myself and therefore better ended. So I found another thing to strive for, which was running. Mm. And in that sense, I had another journey of better never ends. And then with, with my business, I then realized I wanted to do another project and then it it's almost like a life philosophy rather than a task philosophy that's that's the way it works for me i think that made sense i think that you could say that better ends within a specific domain yeah uh within a specific role or specific content uh context but as a life philosophy it kind of makes sense because it allows you to jump between mm -hmm. things jump between identities and roles and domains um it keeps you developing uh, as a human being not mm -hmm. just a runner an athlete a worker or whatever it is, those are the roles that we adopt and the roles that are, that are required of us as human beings. But um, as an individual on a life course, then of course you can jump between those things and, and find improvements across the board. Yeah, there was, there was a good book uh, that got me thinking, first of all, that in fact it was quite a nice little circle that happened, this, this cycle that emerged um, in my own learning that Started, started and ended with Simon Sinek. <laughs> so it, it, the start with why was the one that made me question what is my, my why? What is the, the, the thing that I do that roots everything else? And that was Better Never Ends. And that was 2020, I think I, I read that book. And then this year I read Infinite Purpose. And I read that and thought, oh, I've already got that now. You know, <laughs> Better Never Ends actually does work for an infinite purpose for me. And, mm. and that's, that was quite nice to kind of come, one, one that really challenged that I didn't really have a why. And then one that was grounded in oh i think think i have an infinite purpose and that that works for me and that is my my world view now and it was yeah. a lovely experience to kind of come through that journey no doubt there's more maturity to come but but it was it was good to sort of see that i'm on i'm on a good path in my own space 
Makes sense. But I mean, we, we should take a step back in some ways because the better never ends philosophy that came from, you know, Michael Scabala, as you've talked about, what was that, what was that forged in aid of? Mm. Well, well, he, you know, as a, as a coach, as a manager, you have a problem. How do I help my players develop? What can I tell them and what kind of uh, beliefs can I shape within them that keeps them developing? Whether yeah. that's you know, technically, tactically, physically, psychologically. And that, that, it is a is a door into that. Yeah. If a, if a player can start to see the truth of that, and they can keep developing, yeah. and 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 you know, within a sports domain, there are lots of options for a player to, to to develop. There's lots of support resources they can kind of exploit if you like in order to do that. Outside of that domain, then it, I think it's challenging for people sometimes to understand. Okay, I know I could get better at at this, whatever this is. But where do I go for that information? Who do I turn to? And so it, it kind of, you open that door and there's some possibilities there, but there's also uncertainty and challenges mm. and, and have a, lot, a lot of unpredictability. So in its nature, it, it, it's, it's an activating belief and thought. Mm. Um, it's, it's not necessarily by nature um, automatically positive, but it's, it, for me, it's certainly activating towards something, you know? So what might come after that? So you, you might get, an enabling, empowering message through to someone of better never ends. I guess what you're, you're, you're coming to is that you then need the resources around you or the knowledge base in order to, to, to make use of that. Hmm. I think it becomes a, a, an intellectual challenge initially hmm. and, and problem solving and figuring out, well, okay, how do I develop? How do I get better at, at whatever it is you want to get better at? Um, which I think, and I think it has to be specific. I think you have to nail down exactly what you're driving towards. And maybe we can talk about goals, uh, goals in a minute, in a minute or so. So it's an intellectual endeavor initially, but then it becomes a practical and pragmatic endeavor. How do I, um, orient my life towards this betterment? What do I need to change? What do I need to shift around? What do I need to stop doing and start doing or keep doing? Mm. So it becomes, from my experience anyway, a practical endeavor, you know, the reality of how do I actually make this work? You know, intellectually, you could, you could, you know, spend forever thinking about things you could do, but then the reality is you've got to make it happen on the ground, which means some, some kind of practical ability to, to, to practically move towards your goal and move things out your way or, or pull things towards you or whatever it is. And that means, Managing those multiple domains that we spoke of, you know, family, work, uh, life stuff, hobbies. You've got to manage all that. And you've got to yeah. pull it in the same direction towards that betterment. And what the problem can sometimes be in this, this is, in fact, even if I reflect on my own situation here, sometimes you almost push too hard in one of those domains, sacrificing another without realizing it. And as a result, you then set... You, the, the balance of that happiness is, is, isn't quite right. Mm. So use family, for example. If you're putting absolutely 100% of your energies into betterment of your career, it's unlikely you're going to be able to put what you need to into your family life and that, that could suffer. And once you recognize that, you've got to almost shift and that better never ends becomes almost dysfunctional mm. because if you're only focusing on one domain, and then if you consider it again as a life uh, concept, then you, you will balance it appropriately to ensure that yeah. that happiness can remain. I think there's two things there. I think there's two things, and um, hopefully I remember the first one after after I've talked about the second one. <laughs> <laughs> Go. Um, the first one is something around identity, which we'll come back to. The second one is is a, really around the kind of myth, really, that if I completely focus my attention on one domain that uh, things will be hunky-dory and life will be made for me. Mm. I think that actually um, somebody who dedicates themselves almost 100% to work will for sure or will probably achieve more in work. You know, they'll be more productive and, and all the rest of it. However, they will also probably burn out at some point in their work domain. Mm. And when that happens, they won't have anything to fall back on because they've burned their bridges. You know, they've sacrificed their sort of relationships on the altar of, of sort of work success or money or whatever it is, you know, fame. Um, and also 
this idea that you wouldn't require strong relationships or or meaningful pursuits outside of work in order to be successful in work, I think is also a bit of a myth. I think yeah. you've got to have those things and it creates a um you know a rounded personality or character that actually helps you to deal with the demands of work in a way that wouldn't be possible if you only had this this singular identity which links on to my first point around identity there is a danger there is a precariousness in 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 sacrificing everything in order to pursue work or sport or whatever it is and there is a precariousness there because if you attach your identity to it and you um, almost exclusively identify as a, a worker, an athlete, um, an exerciser, a runner, whatever it is, then when that breaks down, which it will, because you won't always succeed, you'll be ill, you'll be injured, you'll mm. fail, um, you have an identity crisis. If I see myself as um, exclusively a runner and I become injured and can't run, then who am I? So there is a, a precariousness about forging or fusing your identity with your pursuit yeah. and that comes with sacrificing everything for that pursuit and, and naturally the more you sacrifice and only focus on one thing your identity becomes fused with it which for sure, like, as i said by doing that you might achieve more yeah but, but you, at some point the wheels are going to fall off and you you need people to help you put the wheels back on and if you burn through those people through over focusing on one thing then you might struggle even more. You don't then have the, the backup, the people around you to support you. Those relationships that you've mentioned, those all important relationships have then drifted away because they gave you that ultimatum and you, you chose your identity as the athlete, mm. the elite athlete who only focuses on, on their sport, for example. Yeah, that's right. And, and also it, pl it plays into this idea that, um, that life is in some way defined by my ability to accrue resources wealth wealth achievement achievement yeah. you know yeah. um life is about feeding my ego and what you probably come to realize is it's, it's, it's probably more about the relationships you form and being uh, loyal and consistent in those relationships yeah i heard peter atia talk recently who's very well thought of in the longevity uh, sphere and and he he said, it, this, his, it was his personal reflection as well, actually. He said at one point in his career, he was just thinking about achievement and promotions, trying to get as far as he could through his life. And then he was able to acknowledge how unhappy his, his relationship status was and challenge his own conception about what's going to make people happy in this world, what's going to make me feel happy in this world. Is it on my deathbed I've got people remembering me for... Peter who's got a hundred papers and books and this and that and people remember or are they going to remember he was a really good guy really nice to have around he was really respectful and mm. all his friends loved him what's the one that people are going to talk about in your eulogy it's, it's probably going to be about your relationships who you were as yeah. a person not so much oh he released this many books blah 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 yeah yeah you know that guy he was really good at earning money yeah <laughs> yeah you know yeah. but I also think that you know you mentioned the the, the H word there happiness mm. we know that Happiness is really a poor goal for life because happiness really comes about almost unexpectedly. It's quite difficult to plan for happiness. Happiness tends to come about when we get more than we expected. When you speak to people who've achieved a lot in their domains, you know, um, objectively, but also subjectively, they feel like they've really done a, done a mm. decent job. They tend not to necessarily feel happiness. You know, it tends to be relief. And then often anxiety because they now have to repeat this thing and, have to yeah. move on it's kind of the end of part of a journey and maybe move on to a different part which can bring about some some anxiety apprehension so happiness seems to be something that it's very difficult to plan for and it seems like a hedonistic goal it's something that i've come across by reading stoicism is eudaimonia which is more to do with fulfillment and contentment and putting yourself in a position where you could look back and say that that was a life worth living. That was a good life, yeah. which, which it, it, it's not the same as happiness. It yeah. doesn't have that same um, kind of saccharine, uh, superficial positivity. Yeah. There's something uh, deeper and richer, but within that concept of eudaimonia. Almost feels like the contentment side of things is something that can be pretty constant for over a long period of time. But happiness, you cannot have happiness permanently yeah. from what you're saying. So, so then this, the, the, the pursuit of happiness 
yeah. probably is doomed to fail at some point, or almost definitely. But almost definitely, yeah, yeah because you because you know suffering is a fact of life. Mm. We suffer because we exist. Sometimes arbitrarily, sometimes we cause our own suffering or exacerbate our suffering. We suffer necessarily because we're alive. We suffer unnecessarily when we do it to ourselves, you know, yeah. or we exacerbate that suffering. If if the purpose of life was to be happy, then human beings have completely failed. That's not the human experience. Uh, you know, um, ubiquitous happiness isn't something that, that, that you know we we see. It's something that's episodic, momentary. We are lucky and fortunate when we experience it, but to chase it is a bit of a fool's errand. Mm. And, and one of the things you, you mentioned there that can lead to this anxiety or this this sense of emptiness is when you achieve something, and that and that's that's something that could be interesting here. You mentioned goals earlier as well, so you, mm. you might have have a goal, a finite goal. And I've heard a lot of people say this before, both in um, in the media, but also people I'm closer to. They achieve their goal, and then quite quickly after, they're left feeling empty. Mm. And, and that, in fact, that was broached on in the the Infinite Purpose book. And um, what, what, how do you do? How do you deal with that from a goal setting perspective to to help prevent that? Because obviously, achieving a goal can be a positive thing. Yeah, yeah. But if the moment after you've achieved it, there's this negative thing that follows, how do we broach the the target of goal setting? Well, there's a few. I mean, there's there's plenty we can talk about there. There's plenty of. Um the, the idea of goal setting has become cliche, mm. let, let's say, within, what would you call it, the achievement industry. You know, it's like um, smart goals. That, that's something that's become popular and, and really doesn't, doesn't have much evidence from an academic perspective. So you know? specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, timely, isn't timely, it? Timely, yeah. yeah. Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a meme. It's sticky, like a news headline is. Um, does it have any real veracity? I mean, it's looking doubtful. Look, if it, if it helps somebody to do something, then then great. You know, more power to you. Speaking academically, there are some question marks there. M my position on goal setting is more is more around being in a constant state of becoming. Um, partly because when you set a goal, obviously, ideally, you want to move towards it. And it's important to have a goal because it really allows positive emotion. It's quite difficult to imagine positive emotion without goals because it's the feeling that you're moving towards something that brings about that positive emotion. But also the opposite is true, that you have a goal and it's going to bring about negative emotion because there'll be times where you're not moving towards that goal or, or there's a barrier or, or a block. But we're, we're a mobile creature. We're a mobile species. We have to move from A to B, and therefore we need to know what B is, you know? Um, so we've got to know where we're moving towards, which means by necessity we set goals, even if we're not conscious of it. You know, we, we are goal, a goal-directed species. So goals are in, important. Um, when you're moving towards it, you get to experience positive emotion. When you're moving away from it, you get to experience negative emotion. But more but relating to your question, so you're moving towards a goal, having that positive emotion, feeling like you're, you're gaining something. You might experience some happiness, some relief, some contentment. And then you, you reach the goal. Or tying that into the concept of better never ends, you're now in a different place than you were when you set the original goal. So your goals might change. There might be other priorities, other things you want to achieve. So you shift. You, you have to shift because your position has changed. In the position I'm talking to you now, I can see a certain, um, you know, display. If I move, I can see a different display. And it's the same when we think about goal achievement. I'm from this position looking forward to the road ahead towards that goal. And I'm noticing certain things, certain opportunities, certain barriers. When I get to that point, I'm now looking at, uh, at a new road. Yeah. I'm now at a completely mm -hmm. different perspective. So I have to realign. I have to now think about what the next thing is or... Or, or, or change what the what the ideal is and i'll talk about an ideal because i think that is a useful thing to have in mind what's my ideal and then move towards that ideal all the while recognizing that you never get to your perception of ideal because it will change mm. the closer you get to that goal your your perspective changes and therefore the goal might change the goal probably yeah. normally has to change 
makes it less of a of a specific thing and more of an an idea. I guess that's, that's yeah. what you're getting at. Being an ideal, it's it has more interpretations, which yeah. could be changed along the way. And, but by definition, yeah. by definition, it's idealistic. Yeah. And you know, there's people that set realistic goals, and of course, you you shouldn't set yourselves impossible goals. But the problem there is that it's within the eye of the beholder mm. as to what impossible and possible quite often, you know? So we should encourage people to set idealistic goals, but at the same time, encourage them to understand that you might not get there. This, this yeah. is about the journey towards being better in whatever domain. It's not about the destination of being the best. So this is what, so my saying in, in my clinical consultations, I'll say, if you aim high, you might miss high, but that's a lot better than aiming low and achieving. Hmm. So that's probably what I'm getting at without really realizing the language behind it. It's well, look, be idealistic. It speaks to my previous point. If my goal in life is to be happy, then set really low goals. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense, does it? It's yeah. like, well, you should set difficult goals and face the negative consequences of not achieving them. And learn through that adversity, learn through perhaps. It. Yeah. The happiness that you might experience, the contentment is going to be richer, more authentic than if you set really low goals yeah. and then you have this superficial almost um yeah superficial fake experience of positive emotion it's um you know often people who are st struggling with negative emotion that's also their option or i'll just not care about that goal anymore or not aim for it i mean okay that m might be a good short-term solution to step back from things but in the long term i don't think that is a good solution i think it's important that we have the sense that we're moving towards an ideal, no matter what domain you're in, relationships, work, whatever it is, mm -hmm. people take on hobbies and pursuits and try to develop in other domains, not because it rewards them financially or, or, or necessarily gives them a sense of ego. It's because they have this deep need to develop and to learn and to drive towards being better in something. Yeah. Uh, you only have to study human behavior to understand that that's the case. So I, I don't want everyone to just have the same... Um, mindset as me you know that, that wouldn't make any sense the world would be a boring place of course but, but do you think trying to identify your own infinite purpose actually is a pretty pretty good thing to go about if you're not sure what that is at the moment i mean i'm i'm not 100 percent familiar with that terminology um but i do know that when i help people to set goals that are more holistic and are often outside of that domain they tend to achieve more within that domain. So some of the things I've been using to do that is through this idea of stoicism mm -hmm. and getting people to think about orienting their goals, their aims towards the four virtues of stoicism. So we have wisdom, courage, um, we have temperament, uh, temperance and justice. And it's, you know, can I be more wise? Can I learn more about what I'm trying to do? Can I be curious? Um, can I approach things with moderation and not go too far with things? Um, can I be judicious? Can I be ethical and moral as far as I, I can be? Can I be courageous? Can I make difficult choices and move towards uncertainty and, and uh, you know, move towards areas that make me uncomfortable more? If, if you allow those kind of virtues to drive your behavior and aim towards those things, then it, then it brings other stuff with it. Yeah. I, I can't see a world in which aiming towards those things doesn't improve your work performance, your relationships, um, your sporting performance, no matter what it is. It, so, so you kind of, it's taking those things outside of that context and saying as a human being, holistically, how about aiming towards doing this more, seeking more knowledge, you know, so many athletes I've worked with would encourage them to undertake a, a, some sort of college or university course outside of the sport to learn something different. So they feel that they're becoming wiser, you know. Courage is it, you know, it makes its own argument for itself in some ways. There's, there's very little downside to courage. And by courage, I don't mean the absence of fear. I mean moving towards something that you fear. Um, it's very difficult to, to think of somebody aiming towards that and not benefiting within any domain. And this is something I really lean on as a concept as well, this idea that staying within your comfort zone will, will, will keep your comfort zone the same size. 
if you go outside of that comfort zone, you'll go into a fear zone. Almost certainly you go into a fear mm. zone. And as a result, you're hitting the learning zone. And then with time, you desensitize to the fear through learning and you create a larger comfort zone. That's, yeah. that's something I, I've looked at before. I think it really rings true for me. If I'm not doing anything that's making me a little bit scared, I feel like I'm a bit too comfortable. I've, I've spoken about it a lot before and I've tried to root my own decisions within it. Have I, am I still learning here? Mm. If I'm not learning, I'm probably not uncomfortable. If I'm not uncomfortable, then probably need to find something that's gonna make me uncomfortable again. Well, that's what learning feels like. Yeah, it has know? to, otherwise people, you're not really learning. You know, so there, yeah. there is that aspect. The other thing around around comfort, which is interesting, is, you know, in those years that we were working in futsal, one of the things that we spoke about quite often with players is um, learning to be comfortable with discomfort. It obviously sounds oxymoronic, and it obviously is an oxymoron, but the philosophy behind that is essentially what you laid out there. It's like... Can I stretch my comfort zone so, so that kind of the boundaries change yeah. a little bit? Can I get used to the idea that actually high level performance, there is a level of discomfort there, psychological, physical discomfort that I'm probably going to have to embrace. Mm. I mean, at least tolerate and at best embrace and actually start to enjoy that discomfort, start to associate it with that performance domain as something that is just indelibly linked to it rather than something I can choose. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's just part of pursuing something meaningful. Yes. Brings with it discomfort. It's a bit like looking at your bicep and just hoping if you stare at it longingly enough, it will grow. You know? <laughs> yeah. you, you're probably not going to happen no matter how much you want it, how much you, you love that bicep. It's not going to happen. Yeah. You have to go into some form of physical training that's going to be tough. It's going to burn. It's going to make it uncomfortable because that's the way a muscle is going to adapt and grow and get stronger. That's why, right. and, and often one of the reasons that we experience uh, anger, frustration, uh, we get upset, is because we have this belief that we can't tolerate something. Like I can't stand it when mm. this happens, and I can't stand it when they speak to me like that, and I can't stand it when I fail. And this is one of those beliefs that I would work with people to challenge quite frequently within, say, performance domains, work, sport, exercise, whatever it is. It's this idea that. Um, you know, in some way I've reached my tolerance capacity, which is obviously never the case as long as you're still existing. The idea that something, um, you can't tolerate something means that if you experienced it, you turn to dust, which you know, isn't, yeah. usually isn't the case. But, but secondly to that, so partly it's about saying might be uncomfortable and difficult and tough, but I certainly can tolerate it based on the evidence of my continued existence. But secondly, it's worth it to tolerate it has to be worth it. If it's not worth it, then the question is, do I choose to tolerate it or not? Yeah. The idea that I can tolerate something does not mean that you will tolerate it. But f believing that you can gives you that empowerment to decide. I can tolerate it. I'm going to choose to stay in this uncomfortable situation because it's worth it for me to do so because I want to develop. I want to become more skilled and, 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 and fitter and whatever it is. And this is a very individual thing, isn't it? You know, one person might choose to to tolerate it and one person might choose not to tolerate it. They're, they're saying one person says it's worth it, one person says it's not worth it. Yeah, and if you think about the domain of, of interpersonal interaction, conflict resolution, for example, somebody treats me a certain way, I absolutely can tolerate their treatment. I just choose not to. So it arms you with this this kind of confidence that I, I'm, I can tolerate stuff, but I'll... I might choose not to, which means what's my action? Comes back to control again, doesn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Take control of what you can. I'll yeah. speak to that individual and say, well, you know, this isn't doing it for me. Versus I will choose not to do anything about this. I will choose to tolerate it. I can tolerate it and I'll choose to tolerate this continued behavior. In which case, you know, you make your own bed and you've got to sleep in it. And if we go to the other end of betterment here and the the obsessive nature that it could could bring on mm. of I'm I'm gonna keep trying, keep working, keep keep obsessing over being better and 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 your whole life becomes about being better at this thing. We we touched on it earlier. Yeah. Yeah. What what kind of there's there's got to be some negatives attached mm. to that as well, that obsessive nature. And I think that's probably the right word, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I think perfectionism is something that gets thrown around a little bit. Um you know 
I think my stance on perfectionism is similar to what we laid out around goals a little bit. It's like, well, you can strive towards perfect, the ideal, but at the same time, you have to have in the back of your mind this, this notion that you'll never get there because it's not possible. Perfect is, is like a, a fiction. You know, it's, it's sort of figurative. It, it should be held aloft as a model for us to strive towards all the while knowing that we won't get there. And when we don't get there, it's because it's not possible to get there. It's not that I'm weak or an idiot or a fool or I'm stupid or I'm a failure. It's because it's actually not possible to get to that that point of perfection. But I still believe that holding it aloft, at least having some concept of the ideal, some concept of the perfect version of whatever it is you're striving towards, having that to to, to, to move towards is beneficial because you've, you've envisioned it and then you can move towards it. Otherwise, what are you moving toward? Like better for better's sake. Like how do you know if you've achieved anything if there's not some kind of marker in the road to, to get to? So I think having a perfectionistic vision, an ideal of what you want to move towards can be a good thing so long as you also recognize that it's not possible to get there. It's the ideal thing again. Yeah. You know, ideally, that's what we're going for. Yeah. But it might not be exactly it. It could yeah. just be something around it, in, in and around it, that brings some contentment. Yeah. What, what, what you really don't want to do with people is, is in, in cases where they're highly stressed, um, things are difficult, they're emotional, is to encourage them to lower their standards. It's not, that's not a long-term solution. That again is lowering the goal to make somebody feel better. That's not a good long-term solution. It, it's better to, to maintain standards, but help them to beat themselves up less when they don't mm -hmm. um, achieve their goals. Which they're not in any domain. People aren't just going to let you achieve your goals. It's going to be tough. You're going to yeah. fail. You're going to be ill. You're going to be injured, and and people are going to treat you unfairly and with disrespect. Anything worth pursuing has that as part of the process it's part of the satisfaction i i went i achieved this i've got to this stage because of the challenges yeah that's it so it's like you don't need to lower standards necessarily but you do probably need to figure out how to um you know balance things off when things don't go to plan how do i give myself maybe sometimes a stern talking to without going too far, without having to describe myself as a complete idiot and a failure and you shouldn't have done this yeah. and you should have done that. Should and shouldn't, in my mind, don't belong in the performance environment. So that being perfectionistic brings with it shoulds and shouldn'ts. I should be better. I should be there and I'm here. That's problematic. It's very difficult to think of anything positive coming, coming from that. And this, this, this kind of, um, this downward spiral that people can go on when they set a perfectionistic goal, don't achieve it. And their reaction to that is self, um, you know, berating themselves and then applying more and more effort to that thing and then failing again, berating themselves. And they just end up in this, in this yeah. spiral, whereas actually not necessarily about making people change their goals. It can be part of it to reshape things because maybe it's not well defined. Uh, I think it's more about helping them to understand how failure is part of the process and to not, it's not the end of the world when they fail. They're not failures when they fail. It's just look at it as reality. I've failed. I've had a setback. Let me figure out how to stop this happening in exactly the same way again. And if there's someone who, a lot of this conversation, I guess, is coming from the the lens of a, an athlete, perhaps, who's got a very clear objective. But mm. what about the day-to-day -day person who maybe doesn't have that clarity about it and they, they just they haven't quite figured out what it is that they really want to strive for? How does someone go about trying to find out that and decide what's important to them and, and what they work on? Well, I think, you know, speaking about the virtues earlier, that's a good place to start. You know, think, think about developing your, um, developing yourself across those values, across those virtues, mm. you know, being more courageous in the things that you do in life and doing things with moderation and, and trying to be just and ethical and moral, um, trying to learn more and be wise. 
and often people will find find what their calling is mm. you know you often hear people talk about yeah you know i enjoy my job but it's not my call you know it's not my yeah. calling yeah um but i think if, if if they develop themselves in that way through those stoic principles i think that people will find where that is otherwise you know it's like what do i do with my life okay google it i don't know you know it, it's yeah. There's a million things somebody could do, and and, yeah. and uh, it's very difficult to to help somebody to refine that. I think all all you can really do is help them to develop those ideas, and then they will have the courage to to realise what they what they could be doing with their lives, and they're not currently doing. It's a process of self discovery, then, isn't it? And that, that sounds so. like that's the one that's most empowering is the self discovery. Yeah. And when you work with somebody, you're trying to take them deeper into their own psyche, and those things are lurking around there you know they're not sitting on top of the head like okay well i could be doing this or that often they're locked into habits and ideas and uh, the deeper you take them in a conversation the more likely you are to to have that revelation and it, and it starts to come into consciousness and they start to realize you know what i've been thinking i could be doing this with my life instead of this i think sitting down with somebody and saying right what do you want to do that's tough I don't know what people are supposed to answer to those kinds of questions, you know, because it's it's not on the on you know it's not like on the tip of the tongue for, yeah. for, for most people. I think it's a case of getting some depth, but also developing the character, and then you start to figure out. For example, you know, helping somebody to be more courageous means that they're more likely to make the decision to transition between careers if that's what's needed, or to go for that promotion that that gets them the job that they feel that they're most suited for um you you start to get the success or the the betterment as a consequence of character development yeah not the other way around the you, interesting you, thing there is it, it it allows for holistic uh for a holistic nature of decision or or of or of direction just just through that if if you if you're focusing on career then you're probably only going to get career hmm. if you focus on that that virtue it has applications across all domains of your life yeah absolutely and and you know th these aren't obviously aren't new ideas the stoics are trying to figure out how do we live how are we supposed to live you know and they've been around for a while those principles get wrapped into other philosophies and, and even even religions you know and it's and it, it's it's not like um these have just come off the top of my head like here are my four <laughs> <laughs> things that you, you could be doing They've sort of stood the test of time. And I think there's a resurgence in Stoic thought because people feel like they are living superficial lives and, and they are on that in that rat race of, of uh, being, you know, resource getters. And, and um, we've moved away from, from that feeling of fulfilling our purpose and fulfillment. Mm. Um, so because you know everything most things around us tell us that that's what we should be doing we should be trying to earn more money and, yeah, and capitalist society and all that that's yeah. it so we've deviated from that particularly in the west and um i feel like uh, this this new wave of stoic thought is to some extent an antidote to that and it's just so happens that that stoicism was the the forerunner to what I trained in and what I researched. I didn't realize it at the time necessarily, but it's only looking back that you can sort of connect the dots. And it's become more and more important in the work that I do with people to have them read um, stoic ideas um, by you know modern writers, even ancient writers. And they often would say, "This is really, this is really modern. It really yeah. speaks to me now. Um, it, it sort of stood the test of time." So. I could you know I'm just conscious that it sounds woolly you know yeah. like go and read ancient philosophy yeah I think it's more about looking at those four principles and actually understanding what they are and how to act in those ways and then you start to get the outcomes across these different domains I don't think pursuing one domain hell for leather at the cost of everything else necessarily gives you those four things yeah it's the other way it has to be the other way around it is the other way around you know and we've heard this terminology, values and virtues, even in this discussion, slightly been used almost interchangeably. But I, I sense there is a difference between the two. What, how? What is that difference? And, and I, I've heard values used well, and I've heard values used badly. Mm. What? 
what, what do you make of those of that concept there values i think they're related values and virtues ethics morality it's what rules are you going to apply that guides you through life yeah and why do we set rules we set rules because it allows us to make quicker decisions it allows us it informs our actions in a more efficient manner than every time we face a challenge we say okay what what do i think here what do i believe what should i do if you can set yourself up with good strong values beliefs ideas appreciate we're throwing around different terms yeah. here but they are related it's it's about these these rules that you have that guide you through life that allow you to make efficient decisions so that every action isn't this huge problem solving activity it's yeah. i know what to do here because the because my values have have set forth that this is yeah. the choice that I should be making if I'm aligning myself with my values. It's a shortcut. It's a shortcut yeah. and we need shortcuts. Yeah. And, and often we have lots of beliefs that function as the shortcuts. Some of them have no evidence. Some of them have lots of evidence, but they function in the same way. They're, they're designed to um, inform behavior. Take, for example, something like metaphorical truth, which is something you believe to be true because it gets you further ahead than you would be if you didn't believe it. So there's some tribal communities that believe that um, porcupines can throw their quills, which they can't, but believing that they can keeps me away from porcupines. Yeah. So I set a rule and a belief that puts me further ahead than I would if I didn't have that belief. So your beliefs don't necessarily have to be based on truth, but they do have to be based on pragmatism. It has to get you further than you would be if you didn't believe that, that thing. But I think as a general principle it makes sense for people to align their values and beliefs with facts, with logic, but I think most importantly with function. It's got to help. This belief has to help me. It can't hinder me. <laughs> so, so we're almost coming a full circle here. So better never ends is something that can help someone get going and get started and has yeah. a positive value, even though better can end in certain well, well, yeah. functions too. It's like the, the metaphorical concept is, mm. is, is is the benefit it's not necessarily the, the concrete truth of the statement well what do i stand to gain if i mm. believe that better never ends yeah you probably work harder well, try harder you'll do something different maybe that's it. maybe try and learn something new whereas what yeah. do i stand to gain if i don't adopt that belief yeah probably you'll less stay in your comfort zone that's it yeah. so I, th I think it, it, it it's you know it's something for people to, it's worth thinking about what are my values what are my beliefs what rules do i apply as i go through life are they helping me or hindering me and often you know i'm i'm not immune to this even though i study this thing mm. you develop beliefs that aren't helpful yeah and every now and again you have to check yourself and say you know is based on any evidence is this logical to even think in this way is it really helping me and beliefs are habits and the more you believe something and reinforce that belief the harder it is to shake so it takes work to realign beliefs and it's not easy it's not something you can just tell somebody how to do it it's it's constant rehearsal of of the belief that's going to lead you in a better direction convincing yourself of that belief finding evidence for it um that's how you do it it can work negatively as well can't it someone can have a, a dysfunctional belief and they they'll search for evidence that proves that dysfunctional belief or, or they, they they were surrounded perhaps by yeah. evidence that proves that dysfunctional belief and it just reinforces it those become become really difficult to break well it's a confirmation bias that mm. we know that human beings are capable of um and, and you know it's a really powerful idea but it works in the psychological domain in 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 the way that i work in a way that means that if somebody is anxious or concerned or worried about something they tend to bias themselves towards danger. So if I'm if I'm socially anxious, you know, and I'm standing outside a pub and my mates are in the pub and I'm outside, I'm looking inside and there's all these people I don't know and I start to convince myself that they're all going to look at me and stare at me and laugh at me, then, you know, I have a choice there. I can well, I have multiple choices, but two main choices are I walk away and just forget the whole thing and it immediately reduces my anxiety. But then my anxiety comes back worse when I'm in that situation next. So avoidance is rarely the best option. If in the interest of managing emotions, it's rarely a good option. Um, the second choice is to is to do it anyway, and you know, kind of be in the moment and understand that it's not going to kill you and um, it's not the end. It's just a feeling. It's just a thought. 
But what people tend to do when they're in those situations is that they are biased towards people looking at them in a certain way. You might, you might hear laughter behind you and convince yourself they're laughing about you. You start to make things up, basically, um, that, that kind of fits your idea mm. that people do look down upon me, people do laugh at me. If you choose to go into that pub, then you have to deal with that bias and understand that it is a bias. It's probably not reality. And even if it was reality, it's still not the end of the world. You know, it's still tolerable. Um, it doesn't really say anything about me as a human being. You, you can still derive some enjoyment out of that experience if you allow yourself to. So I think th this, this idea of confirmation bias on the negative is really, really powerful. And we see it less often applied on the positive. My approach would be to you know, have confirmation bias on the positive. Why don't you search for evidence that, you know. It is safe in that pub. Yeah, <laughs> you see. In, yeah, when, you, when you see your mates, are they smiling? Are they happy to see you? you, know, they, it's a, when, you when you do look around, how many people are not looking at you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that kind of thing. It's a much more uh, laborious and conscious process. Mm. It, it feels more, it feels easier and more automatic to spot the negative. That's just how we've um, evolved, you know. Yeah. So, well, it is, was evolutionarily beneficial to some extent, right? To, to have course, a bias yeah. towards fear. It was probably helped us to be, to survive. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And let's face it, in, in our ancestors didn't have to live till 70 and 80. They didn't have to deal with the consequences of, of a, a poor psychological approach. Yeah, to, a negatively to, biased to psychological approach. Yeah. You know, because they'd pass on their genetics and then they'd be done at 25. Yeah. If you, you know, so we have this, 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 um, it's not, I mean, it's a problem living longer in a sense that we, we don't necessarily have the capacity or the innate capacity to plan for the long term. We have to learn the tools almost. Yeah. You're genetically given a predisposition towards fear and you then have to learn how to tolerate that in the modern society. Yeah, yeah. We, with all its, its complex trappings, which mm. were not faced by our ancestors, they faced tangible problems like running away from a big cat or or yeah. you know, hunting something for, for days maybe and then social media comes along and, and yeah. an algorithm starts playing with those biases as well mm. and starts feeding you things that that drive that confirmation bias quite often for the negative as well yeah, yeah i mean and this is how news headlines work mm. as well they feed into those biases and mm. we're more likely to read something with an extremely dogmatic negative headline than we are with a balanced you know kind of nuanced headline yeah um, and these news companies are trying to make money, so that, that, that's what they're going to work towards. Because the more attention they grab, the more money they of get. Course, that's yeah. what that's what the currency really is, isn't it? It's attention. I mean, I drove past a poster earlier. Uh, it was a some sort of a sporting network, and it said, um, "Sport isn't just sport. Sport is everything." Yeah. I thought, well, it's not, is it? <laughs> <laughs> but this is you know this massive poster, yeah. and you wonder what kind of influence that has on people engaged. Yeah. in sport this yeah. idea that sport is everything and you see it in the stands as well to some people sport appears to be their everything mm, yeah <laughs> but perhaps actually that weirdly that i would have said in my early years teenage years i would have definitely gone on with that sport is everything mm, would have felt yeah. that the older i've got i've recognized that hang on a minute that doesn't doesn't quite ring true in the end but yeah. but i would have believed it earlier on in my in my life perhaps with maturity it's it's it has evolved somewhat, but I, I know plenty of adults and who, who would absolutely say that, yeah, sport's everything to me. Yeah, yeah. Whether they really mean that or not is different. But well, This is the question. Yeah. You know, this is the question. Is it something that you're parroting or is it something you really believe? Yeah. If you really yeah. believe that work is everything, sport is everything, you know, whatever it is, put an X there, X is everything, then you you are putting yourself in a kind of a needlessly precarious position because that everything won't last forever. Mm. And then what are you going to fall back on? You know, I think Alex Ferguson said, get, you know, get a hobby. Yeah. You know, you've got to have something there. You can't just be this one sided, one dimensional thing. It, it's, it's precarious because that thing isn't going to go, um, swimmingly all the time mm. and it will end one day. You yeah. retire or you'll get fired or, or whatever it is, yeah. you know, um, and you need to have something to transition into. If you burn those bridges, then you're transitioning into nothing. And I think what we're summarizing with there is that you need to have a broadness across your your passions or, or even just your... And that's where these stoic 
um, virtues are, are applicable, I think, to everyone is if you if you think more broadly and holistically, it's much more likely that you're going to be content throughout your life. Whereas if you're single-mindedly focusing on one particular part of your life, whether that be your job, your your athletic pursuits, um, whatever that might be, there's a chance that when that go when that disappears or fails, you've got nothing. Yeah. And I've, I've definitely heard people have that experience. So it's a cautionary tale almost, isn't it? Of just look holistically at, at, at everything and, and the benefits will likely then come with everything <laughs> yeah. rather than that one single domain that maybe you're focusing the most on. I think that's the tricky thing because it does feel like to achieving something, um, you have to be hyper-focused on that thing. And there is some truth in that. Mm. But um, I'm, not necess- I'm not sure if that has anything to do with fulfillment mm. or contentment. I think that has to do with very specific success in a specific domain. If that's the drive, then you you will probably achieve that thing, but you will sacrifice stuff that probably isn't worth sacrificing as you pursue that thing exclusively and at the cost of everything else, you know? So I think that, that this idea of being holistic is important, but, but how do I want my character to, to develop? What kind of person do I want to be? Or, you know, rather than what do I want to achieve? Mm. That, that question is very goals, but what do I want to achieve? It's like very specific yeah. to a goal, which is why I think it's more precarious, you know? If we're thinking of these um, cautionary tales, perhaps, what, what other layers would you add on? Is there anything that we haven't spoken about today that you think might be an important layer to add on to, to that for someone who, who is trying to pursue something better in their life? I think it's to understand that um, in line with that, with the holistic comments that we've been making, that there isn't real, there's no real separation between the mind and the body. We separated them for some reason in the past um, because that's probably how it seemed that the mind was separate to the body and, and you know, I've got this, this way of thinking that doesn't seem sometimes connected with reality. And let's face it, we can think fantastical things that don't have any basis in reality. So I can understand how it might have seemed, but there is a connection there. If you find that your physical health is declining, you will find that your mental health declines and the opposite is also true. If you don't look after the mental side of of achievement, of life, then you will find physical declines. We, we understand this more now than ever. And, you know, there's lots of reasons for that that we can go into um, from a chemical perspective of, of a stress hormones and things like that. But ultimately, cutting through all that stuff, we know that stress has a body consequence. Yeah. And, you know, being physically unwell, injured, can have a psychological consequence. So you, you can't just focus on one of these things. It's got to be holistic. You've got to bring all of that stuff with you. And, and that's the only way you can really optimize or, or fulfill your potential, for want of a better word, is, is to really take both of those boxes, not just one. And how might someone learn a bit more about you, uh, uh, Martin? How might someone just find out a bit more about where, what you do, how you, how you practice, what would be a good way to get in touch if they're interested by your conversation today? Yeah, you can reach out to me on Twitter at Dr. MJ Turner, also on LinkedIn and all those kinds of things. Um, and have a website, a Smarter Thinking Project and Smarter Thinking Profile. The profile website is one where you can, uh, you can complete a profile, a bit of a survey, then it will give you kind of a downloadable PDF report that tells you the kinds of performance beliefs that you have a lot of the stuff that's in line with what we've been talking about um, today. And also there is an app people can download for free and the profile is free as well. And the app walks you through how to develop these kinds of beliefs that are logical and realistic and pragmatic. So yeah, those are the ways that people can, can, can engage with, with stuff. Um, There's some books people can buy as well. Some are academic, some are non-academic, but you can see those on Amazon and see what takes you fancy. That's great. And this, this felt like just an extension of our normal coffee chats that we have. But uh, yeah, I'm glad we managed to get, get nice and deep for the podcast. And hopefully our listeners appreciate that. Thanks for coming on. Hey, and I, I absolutely think you'll, you'll be coming on again at some point because this is just one small part of, of what you do in your practice, I know. So it'd be quite nice to have a look at some of those other parts in the future. Yeah, absolutely. It's great to just 
capture one of these conversations that we often have anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> going deep. Yeah. Yeah. All right, thanks so much. Cheers, thank you. Thanks for listening to today's podcast. This podcast is sponsored by Better, provider of health, wellness and performance services based in central London. You can book in for face-to-face services at either of our two clinics, one in Soho and one in the city. You can also follow us on Instagram at Better Never Ends or head over to our website for more information about the clinics or the podcast at www.betterneverends.com. And of course, if you want to send us an email with any feedback, questions or suggestions for future episodes, then email us on podcast at betterneverends.com. And finally, thanks to Brian Long for editing the show. Without him, it's absolutely no doubt in my mind that these would never have seen the light of day and um, it will allow this podcast to continue on for as long as I'll keep recording them. So thanks very much, Brian.